Hello everyone, Jonathan back once again with a pair of pistols. Actually, technically they might not be quite a pair because they are ever so slightly different. Um, there's a reason for that, which I will explain uh, at the end. It's not really that relevant, they're effectively a, a pair. I've chosen them because I think you can see why I've chosen them. They're really oddly shaped. For, not for modern pistols, of course. We're used to this kind of perpendicular sort of L shape ergonomic design for a pistol. But something that I'm asked quite a bit on and off is why traditional flintlock, percussion, whatever they are, wheel lock pistols are shaped more like a stick. <laughs> to a greater or lesser extent, they do tend to be not necessarily straight. Some very early designs, wheel locks, are actually very straight. They really are just like pointing a stick. A lot of them are curved, and of course the classic sort of piratical flintlock pistol of the 18th century, say, or the dueling, so-called dueling pistol, they are all, um, they have a curve. We can recognize them as pistols, but they're nothing like as, as dramatically angled as this. The closest thing to these is what's called a, a saw handle butt. Um, so I'll show you a picture of one of those from the collection, but that is a conventional flintlock or percussion pistol with a pretty vertical grip and a pronounced overhang here. Hence, they were nicknamed uh, later on saw handle grips. And they are for target shooting for that very precise aim. Uh, so, yeah, on this, this extremely steeply angled, almost boomerang shaped lock plate, which has to be that shape in order to fit in a mainspring. And that's paralleled in the modern pistol by modern revolvers and, and non-revolver pistols, as it were, nearly always having a spring within the grip. Well, here it is effectively within the grip as well, or some of it is, in fact, the vast majority of it is. Um, it will be, we're not going to take the locks off because these are very nicely fitted and probably haven't been off in a very, very long time. But there will be a V-shaped mainspring along this leg of the lock plate. On a modern pistol, it will tend to be at the very, very rear of the frame. But, you know, it's, it's edging that way because it has to. Where else are you going to put it? Um, that may be one reason why designs tend to favour that more straight shape. No one's complaining about the shape of it at the time, other than maybe target um, pistol people. So your only, your only option is to elongate the whole gun and have a saw handle grip back here or to stick with the conventional, somewhat banana-shaped pistol to give you space for that great big V-shaped mainspring. It gives you all of the power to drop this hammer hard enough to set off the cap, in this case, because these are percussion pistols. Same applies to the flintlock mechanism. So that name, uh, Vassalon, doesn't, we don't have an initial, um, the French name Vassalon, and Marseille, obviously the, the French city of Marseille, and we do have, given the, given the style of these, we can be fairly sure that this is actually the Vassalon brothers who are operating on, I believe it was 54 uh, Rue Vacon in Marseille. So we have an address, we have a company that we could research. I haven't gone down that rabbit hole for the, just for this video, but um, uh, I, except to look up the, in the big book of, of gun makers to get that information that I've just given you. I'm not sure who these guys were or what else they made. Um, a quick auction search revealed only a pair like this, funnily enough, um, and that was not by searching on their name. So that was, wasn't, ma wasn't made by them. So these, these are super rare, as far as I can tell. One other pair that I could see that had been sold in the last sort of decade or so, very similar, but without the external trigger and trigger guard. It's not, not clear from the description or from the images, but it appears to have a drop-down spur trigger like we've seen on some other designs. So, so very rare, very unusual with the steeply curved grip. There, there, there are these, um, these saw handle target pistols, but they're way, the grips are usually way chunkier and with a big protruding rear spur here. This is, this is almost vestigial. Um, it does make for an extremely comfortable 
design, for me anyway. Obviously, hand size make, you know, is a factor here. So the grip itself is almost cylindrical. Well, it's, it's, that's unfair to the designer, really. It's sub-cylindrical, I suppose. It's heavily tapered. Let's see how the, or, or moderately tapered, I suppose. From here down to the butt cap, which is just a plain, plain cap with a little bit of decorative scalloping around the edges. Um, the name, I should have said, actually is, is actually, it's engraved, but then it's inlaid with a tiny amount of gold. So we have a little bit of flourish on the name. And a little bit of decoration, but it's, it's pretty sedate. Just some lining on the breech area and on the barrel tang. A single line outline, which was standard at that time. You, you almost wouldn't produce a, a gun without some sort of lining, decorative lining. Very nicely done, but very plain. The barrel, obviously, it's octagonal. Very shiny blued finish. And we've reason to believe that's been refinished. The rest of the metalwork is, you can just about see, I think, there's, it, it was color case hardened. So it would have been um, much like a, a single action army revolver frame, that very nice sort of oil slick finish. It does tend to fade over time. and has to be um, brought out with etching. But it's still there, you can see it. Not much more to say about it, really. Conventional fixed trigger guard, curved trigger blade. So, um, well, there's <laughs> apart from the, the vertical grip, there are two other important features, I would say. Sights, so we have some really quite precise sights. So a vertical plate sticking up at the rear there with a with quite a deep V notch in it. It might be hard to see on camera, but it's in there. My color of my glove might help. And then you're lining that up with a a quite a precise front blade sight as well, dovetailed into the barrel. So proper target pistol sights, and they work really well. for quite a precise aim. And what would be the point, really, if you didn't have some rifling? So we have 13 groove rifling. Narrow, deep grooves. Um, I haven't checked what the twist rate is. It will be relatively shallow because muzzle loaders. You can't have too much of a twist rate. So a modern, something like a modern rifle will have a, a one in seven, one turn in seven inches very fast rate of twist to, to get that bullet fully stabilized. Uh, muzzle loaders, I mean, you're lucky if you get one turn in the whole barrel, and certainly in a barrel this short, it'll be, it'll be, it'll be very sedate. But then they're firing spherical projectiles, which are easier to spin stabilize. We do that all the time when we throw cricket balls, baseballs, whatever. So the, these are kind of like target pistols, but they're very, very small. So what are they really? Hard to say, to be honest. I think they're just, they're whatever the um, purchaser would, would wish them to be. You could carry them for self-defense purposes with a, a hammer down on a cap, and then when you're ready, bring them to full cock. There is a half cock position on this, uh, which is pretty standard, but not everything does have that. Or maybe somebody just really likes the challenge of target shooting with a short barreled gun. Um, Two drawbacks to that, I suppose, if you're, if you're for, well, not less so for modern pistols, a short barrel isn't, it doesn't hold them back hugely because of the modern cartridge system and pressure curves and everything. A barrel this long is easily enough for a modern pistol to shoot quite accurately out to quite a distance. But at the time, that's going to give you a, a relatively small powder charge and limit your effective range and penetration as well if you're trying to effectively stop somebody if it were a self-defense thing. I'm, I'm not convinced that you would carry something like this for that purpose. I think these are still a, a pair of, or near pair of target type pistols. They just have to be very small and very unusual. Some, a customer was clearly, um, well, more than one customer, because we know of at least one other pair like this, but maybe this was a product offered um, as standard, or maybe it was 
semi-custom, or you never quite know with this kind of handmade thing. Uh, now, the, the other pair that were offered, uh, by I believe it was a French auction house, were described as uh, Model Delvin, and that might trigger some, some memories for, for some of you who know a bit about either French service revolvers or if you looked up what um, Rick O'Connell was using in The Mummy, because <laughs> the Chamolot Delvin Model 1873, well, the Delvin in that, that's Henri Delvin, who um, uh, died in 1876, so was, was quite an old, relatively old man by the time he contributed to the design of that revolver. If indeed these are, this is a design by Henri Delvin, oh, sorry, by Delvin, um, then it's going to be Henri Delvin. I can't think who else it could possibly be. So he was a Parisian uh, designer. Um, that's, that's the connection as, as far as I can uh, surmise. Um, there's probably some more work to be done on these, but I thought you'd like to see them because I think they're, they're really cool. Um, they do kind of answer that, that query. Why, why are pistols so weird shaped in the past? Well, it wasn't weird to them. Uh, it's just weird looking back, but um, it's, hard to, it's hard to ignore that this feels better to a modern eye and a modern hand, as it were, as a pistol than the classic shape. Uh, now, quick word on the, the shiny barrels on these and how that ties into their history. So these, these came to the armories in 1967 from the Renkin Brothers collection in Belgium. So we purchased, um, as the tower armories, we purchased a collection of 600 odd items, historic firearms, already historic in many cases, when the Renkin Brothers were collecting them in the 1870s, I think it was, onwards. Um, so these would not have been very old, potentially, although we, for all we know, they picked them up in 1966, but <laughs> um, they may not have been that old when they picked them up. What they tended to do, uh, partly because they were using this collection as a weird sort of catalogue for customers, so you could, you, when you could still have a custom muzzle-loading weapon made, you could say, I want this feature, that feature, the other feature, and so it was like a 3D catalogue, as well as a sort of corporate semi-corporate museum collection. Um, so they refinished most things. And so if when you see something of the mid to late 19th century in our collection that's very shiny, we have to have a closer look at it because often it's been refinished. Now, the evidence here is less than what we would see if there'd been a name on the barrel where it's a little bit blurry, where it's been refinished. A lot of this just comes with the experience of looking at lots of guns. Um, but I do think these these are. One of them has, I don't think it's going to show up on camera, but um, one of them does have almost sort of overspill bluing, if that makes sense. So they've done a beautiful chemical acid, lots of rubbing blue job on this over the whole barrel. And then they have uh, gently filed off, uh, polished off essentially, the crown, so that the crown of the barrel is still bright metal, but on one of these two, there's still traces of bluing on the inside angle, if that makes sense. So I think they've been, they have been refinished. To what extent, uh, I don't know, and it was done a very long time ago. So it's not like they were falling apart and someone has given them a, uh, has, has refurbished them recently. It's part, part of their history as an object, but I thought it was worth mentioning because it does, to me, at least, it sticks out a bit as, as a bit shiny. So the main point here is that distinctive vertical pistol grip, uh, near vertical. So although the overall impression of these is, it's like a percussion, I don't know, whatever you like, 1911 Glock, Luger. You know, it has that classic pistol silhouette, modern pistol silhouette. But it's not, I don't think the, the thing to directly compare it to is a self-loading pistol. That's a ways off. So the, the Vassalon brothers are recorded at, um, in Marseille in 1855. I don't know how, how long they've been there, and I'm not sure how long they carried on working there, but we know 1855 is when they were definitely there. And that would fit the general style of, this, of these things. So circa 1855 would be the date. What's going on at that time? Well, four years since the British Adams revolver, it's quite a few years since the French, since the, um, the Colt patent, 1835 and then 1836 in America. So the, 
the, the modern pistol shape as we recognize it was already established by the revolver. So in that way, these aren't hugely forward thinking. But nonetheless, for a single shot pistol, very, very rare indeed. You, the, the revolver has to have that vertical grip to accommodate, it well, doesn't have to. We, we have very early revolvers with a more of an inline curved stock with a cylinder in it, but it's awkward, it's heavy. It makes much more sense to start dropping the, uh, the butt down into this sort of shape. So if this is aping anything of the time, it has to be the revolver. Uh, they also do tend to have that cylindrical grip at this time. Um, sometimes more sort of broom handle shaped than, than this. But yeah, it's definitely not the slab sided shape of a modern self-loading pistol. Of course it isn't. It doesn't have to carry a magazine in it. So this is, um, I guess, in a way, a pistol for people who like the ergonomics of the newfangled uh, percussion revolver, but don't want to mess about with the the nasty revolving cylinder for whatever reason. Because the obvious advantages of that are five or six shots versus just the one. As, as to why these things change shape so drastically from, from the classic era of muzzle-loading pistols to today, I think fashion has a lot to do with it. Um, and expectations and understanding of what we now know to be ergonomics, if that, if that makes sense. So we, we now recognize that it's, it's always better to have a pretty vertical uh, pistol grip, whether it's the, the 1911 pistol grip angle, or some people prefer the more rakish angle of the Luger pistol grip. They're all, to a greater or lesser extent, much more vertical than these vintage, very vintage antique type pistols. And I think just over time, fashions have changed. Um, the, uh, the need to be as precise as possible with a pistol, even if it's at very close range, you're gonna be more accurate hitting a particular spot. That sort of imperative has got more over time. So the, this, this, the characteristics of a target pistol, rifling, decent sights, and ergonomics conducive to getting that shot on target, rather than pointing in the direction of the enemy and pulling the trigger, I think that's the change that explains these things. Thanks very much for watching, everybody. Um, as always, check out our, our website. Apart from anything else, we have our online collection there. You can have a, a mooch and see what, what we actually have hidden behind the scenes. Um, you can also check out our various events that are going on uh, with our social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, we have our new Up in Arms series that hopefully you've already, already seen. Uh, but if you haven't, definitely check that out as well. Uh, there's me over on GameSpot 2. Uh, most importantly for us, if you can possibly come and visit us, please do. We have a lot of things going on um, throughout the year and some great displays that are there all year round as well. Uh, but whatever you do to support us, we really appreciate it. And we'll see you again next time.